Today, I'm going on a deer hunt. That's a sentence I never thought I'd hear myself say. Killing animals is far from what I would consider a great way to pass the time. But as a regular meat eater, I have to admit, I'm still a hunter of sorts. The difference is people like Colin take responsibility for the kill. Scatty, when you get a deer? Yeah. It's a prey animal and I'm the predator. And we don't just shoot them for fun, we want to eat them and we also respect them and we won't waste them. All right, we're going to drop off here, Steve. Drop into there, you'll see a, see a nice little wild cherry in about there. Yep. Drop into there and then slowly pick your way down the right. gut there. Yep. The man on the right. OK, all right. Yep, good hunt, mate. Cheers. But many hunters also genuinely believe they provide an important service to the environment by controlling the numbers of feral animals. Evidence is there in terms of the numbers of animals that are being killed, the low cost to the taxpayer of those animals being killed. Uh, conservation hunters are in there every day, every week, every month, every year, year after year. Is this claim backed by science? Feral animals like foxes, cats and rats have been responsible for most of Australia's native mammal extinctions. Reducing their numbers is one of our greatest conservation challenges. We've lost about 27 mammal species, which is by far the worst record in the last few hundred years anywhere in the world. And we have a whole range of other species that are threatened with extinction as well. More recently, hard-hoofed animals started their assault on wildlife habitats. The most elusive and underestimated of these are deer. Their numbers have exploded in recent decades, and now they're getting a lot of bad press. It's an animal that can browse up to six foot high, and it can also graze, and it's taking everything. It's sambar deer that are the largest and most destructive. The day before the hunt, Roger Bilney took me through East Gippsland Forest to point out why he believes they're one of our worst emerging feral pests. He published one of the first papers on their impacts in 2005. This is uh, Hazel Pomoderis. That foliage up there should be all the way through, but it's been heavily browsed, even break down the main stems uh, to get access to it. So all this would have been a thicket? It's an absolute thicket. See all these stalks? That should, you shouldn't see the stalks, that should be all leaf. Deer are selective, but not just for species that taste good. These yellowwood trees have been antler rubbed to near death, apparently due to their lovely citrusy smell. 70 odd percent of these are, are, are some state of um, mortality. They will soon die. So does that mean you could actually lose this species from the rainforest? Yes. There's only one threatening process on this planet, and that is the salmon here. Younger trees that normally grow to fill gaps in the canopy are over-browsed and broken, leading to changes in moisture and light levels on the forest floor. Well, the rainforest is a fire break. It's a natural fire break. And uh, as we br it breaks up and we get other species and grasses moving into there, fire will travel through a lot more. This is a classic example of what deer can do to a tree that they find tasty. This foliage would normally be all the way down to the ground, but the deer have browsed it up to here, which is as far as they can reach. Studies on deer impacts from the US and New Zealand suggest forest understories can change dramatically and may never return to normal. Despite their impacts, in the southeastern states where they're most common, deer are not listed as a pest species, but rather as a protected game species. And that's a major bone of contention. To list them as protected species is wrong. The hunting uh, regimes that the government sponsor deliberately avoid the mechanisms that would be most effective, such as spotlighting and shooting at night and aerial culling of deer. I believe aerial shooting for samba deer won't work because of the nature of the deer. They're not a herd animal. Uh, they won't run. They, they tend to hide. I'll just check out this, this uh, rub here. Um, 
This shows me that the deer has been here not so long ago. Defence of deer as a game species is intense, and during my morning with Colin, I understand why. Deer hunting is much more than a sport, it's a way of life. Do you notice the change in the wind just now? It's coming from behind us now, which is really bad. If you hunt samba in this country, you have to be observant. I think hunting is a very grounding experience. It's directly relating to nature and you getting back to basics and it's, it's not some make-believe thing that happens on a computer screen. The Shooters and Fishers Party say that by preserving and protecting the culture of hunting, conservation will also benefit. Can you tell me the idea behind conservation hunting? can call it conservation hunting in the context of Australia where you hunt feral animals uh, almost as a contingent benefit of, having hunting, of hunting animals that you want to hunt. The term conservation hunting was used by the recently abolished New South Wales Game Council to promote recreational hunting as a form of pest control. In those state forests since 2006, I think they've decked around an average of about 20,000 animals a year. But the science on the reproduction rates of pest species suggests it's not as simple as a body count. A lot of our invasive species can actually increase their populations very quickly. So a fox population, as an example, can increase by nearly 100% per year. And so to actually reduce that population to a point where you can actually remove it completely, or at least reduce it to a large degree, you have to kill about 70% of that population every, every year, which is a huge effort. Probably the best study that's been done on this was a study in Victoria when they introduced a bounty system on foxes. And the best that they, they could do is 4% of the population. And that effort wasn't directed at the right places. So what point is that? It's like swatting flies and thinking you're making a difference. 160,000 dead foxes is 160,000 dead foxes. There for everybody to see. Contrary to claims of reducing the populations of feral animals, there is evidence that in some cases hunting helps them spread. At Murdoch University, Dr Peter Spencer has been studying the DNA profile of various feral pig populations, which are a favourite target for WA shooters. While pigs from different regions were found to have distinctly different genetics. The other thing that we found, which was an absolute surprise was that there were genetic signatures of some pigs that we found in some populations that were very, very uh, characteristic for pigs that we would expect to find in another very different population. But where we found this happening was uh, between an area of about, there's about 400 kilometres of open country where pigs just simply don't exist. So they're not moving across that landscape, uh, so that the only explanation was that they really must be actively being moved into these new populations. A survey in 2000 found that more than half of all deer herds had been established due to illegal translocations. Deer were observed in no less than 30 new locations between 2002 and 2004. You know, there are criminals in every uh, walk of life. It is illegal to transport feral animals. Uh, in fact, the fines are uh, up to, I think, $55,000 per offence. The scientists uh, that have given you that information, what's their answer? You know, yeah, let, let's have a look at species extinction in this country over the last 10 or 15 years. Let's have a look at, at the impact on, uh, on agriculture of feral animals over the last 10 or 15 years. Has their methods been effective? No. Although it sounds like they're at loggerheads, there is evidence that scientists and hunters working together can achieve feral animal control. I think we're not opposed to hunting per se. We're all about effective feral animal control. Volunteer shooting by skilled hunters in a targeted way through a coordinated program can be an effective component of a feral animal control program. Goat culls in Victoria are just one example where a united effort has brought down a pest species dramatically and reduced impacts on the environment. If there's deer that are a problem in an area, we would certainly be available to deal with that. 
We've got people who, who are trained and accredited that can um, hunt the deer safely and eth ethically and uh, remove the deer from the area or, or certainly reduce the numbers. Yeah, I think most scientists and ecologists would agree that if there was a strategic plan to actually go and shoot a population and bring its numbers down, then certainly um, professional hunters could potentially could be quite beneficial in that sense. But I think letting recreational shooters go into areas and using that as a form of pest control is going to be largely ineffective. Without a careful strategy, the well-intentioned random shooting of feral animals can actually have harmful consequences. As an example, if you kill foxes, cats will increase because foxes actually are a very effective control method for cats. And so when you're managing species, you have to actually think of all the species in that system and you actually have to manage them at the same time. And it's very difficult to do that as a hunter. It's very difficult to go in there and say, let's shoot pigs, foxes, cats, all these species at the same time. Controversially, Dr Ritchie argues that in some areas, the best solution may be leaving animals like dingoes in the landscape. If you actually have native predators in the landscape, they're actually essentially doing that service for you. Um, they're doing it 24 hours a day, they're doing it seven days a week, and they're doing it for free. But where does that leave farmers who lose livestock to predators? One of the suggested solutions is guardian animals, which have been successfully used to protect both native populations and livestock. Essentially, they protect the flock again 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so the farmer can basically sleep at night knowing that their flock is protected. Remember, sheepdogs um, are very effective at protecting sheep against wild dogs. We've used alpacas as well against things like foxes. And they have a, a fantastic benefit in that they can actually protect the stock while also not having to go and shoot things like dingoes at the same time. But dingoes and foxes don't prey on deer. How to control their growing populations is an argument that's likely to go on for some time. Oh, somebody got something. She was dead as soon as I pulled the trigger. She just rolled straight down the line. A deer like this will last about two to three months of uh, good eating. Our family will enjoy that. Man and hound. Well done. Among these men, there's no talk of any conservation service performed today. It's just hunting for its own sake. <laughs>